Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar, Helping Aging Parents Adapt to Change. My name is Kelly Blount and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead. Thanks to technology, we're excited to be able to connect with you on such a great topic and wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of your home or wherever you may be this evening. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Matt Rocha to introduce himself and take us through today's topic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Rocha, and this is a, a very, very popular topic um, that I'm very glad to talk about today because one of the things when you look at the industry right now, the baby boomer generation makes up around 70 million people. And so that that generation includes the ages between 58 and 76. So when we talk about webinars that we do across the country from a security benefit standpoint, this is one of the top three presentations that we consistently get asked about. So I'm excited to, to dig deeper down into this. And um, at the end of the day, our goal is to help you create a communication plan that will help you prepare to help aging parents adapt to change. So again, as Kelly said, my name is Matt Rocha, West Security Benefit. We are a 130-year-old Kansas-based company. And when we look at aging parents, so aging affects everyone differently, but regardless of how sharp and fit our parents might be, there will likely be eventual declines in their mental or physical. And when that happens, you or your family members may need to step in and assist. Now, I know that it is a scary proposition. In fact, 55% of adults ranked being responsible for aging parents ahead of both spouse's health and also family health catastrophes as their biggest fear. Now, I fully understand this one. My wife and I are both um, in our 40s. Um, my parents are in their 70s. Her parents are in their 70s. So we are actually in this exact range right now. So, you know, as, the, as your parents age, they do become more vulnerable to a variety of risks, financial, physical, and emotional. So as adult children, obviously all of us want to protect them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to, to explore several aspects of caring for aging parents. So we'll go through costs, we'll identify issues that may impact a parent's well-being. We'll talk about how to prepare for a plan, and then at the end, we'll discuss proper steps and how to be respectful of your parents' wishes. So the, the first topic that we'll cover is, when do you need to intercede? This is a very interesting stat. As I said before, 70 million people are between the ages of 58 and 76. So we don't know how long we'll live or how long our parents will live, but it is wise to develop a plan that anticipates and accommodates for longevity. About 100,000 baby boomers turn 65 every single day. So when you think about it, on one hand, living longer, that's a great thing, right? More time to spend with family and friends and so forth. On the other hand, it can be very costly and having a plan that encompasses a potential need for long-term care and other financial concerns can be a prudent part of your process. A 65-year-old woman today can expect to live to 87. This is up about five years than it was a decade ago. When you look at men, a 65-year-old man can expect to live to age 84. Again, Great problem that we're living longer, but that does bring up more from a cost standpoint. So this is one of the most interesting slides of the entire presentation, because although it might be awkward, we want it's important to set up a meeting dedicated to discussing in as much detail as possible what your parents' resources, wants, and needs are, and their thoughts about the future. You absolutely want to include siblings too, if, if applicable. Communication is going to be the key here. So these types of discussions typically take place when the 40-70 rule is. 
And what the 4070 rule is, it is when a when a child is 40 and a parent is at least 70. And the whole discussion around this is our loved one's well-being is the goal. And what I've seen personally and historically, we, there's two ways to look at this. So we have seen where let's say you let's say you take it from the 70 year old perspective. What has worked very well is when the 70 year old already has a documented plan. Like I'll use my my mom for an example. So my mom already has um, funeral arrangements, estate plan. She already has all the retirement, everything written down and documented. So she basically came to myself and my two siblings and said, "Here's what I want to have happen." That makes it immensely easier for us. So, so, but then you look at it from a 40 year old perspective and we talk about the 40, 70 rule. I'll use um, uh, one of my, my, my wife's friends as an example. So their parents are in their seventies, their children are, are in their forties. Um, my wife's friend went to her father and said, I would like to start to talk about a plan for the next steps. And her dad made a joke and said, you can just take me out to a field. Now, while they were joking about that, and a lot of people do joke about it to make it lighthearted, um, there was never any serious follow-up. And one of the things that we, we mentioned to our friend was we said, well, the important part is just get the conversation started. So the idea, as we'll go through this, is if it's an awkward conversation, just bringing up points that we'll talk about can typically start to generate the conversation. But again, so the 40, 70 rule is when a parent when a, when a child is 40 and a parent is at least 70 to discuss these items that you see out here on the right hand side so an estimated 5.8 million americans age 65 and older are living with alzheimer's dementia in in 2020 80 percent are age 75 or older so this is a question we get asked quite often. And here are a few key signs to look for to identify changes in a parent's behavior that could indicate potential health problems. Memory loss is a big one. Uh, appearance, socialization. So a lot of times your parents, they may become forgetful and have difficulty following conversations or ask the same questions over and over again. Now that's typically going to happen uh, my dad always jokes, he's 73, he always jokes with me that he's like, yeah, I, you know, Matt, you already told me this three or four times, but, which is understandable, and, and honestly, people that are much younger than myself can have that as well, but it's, you have to look for consistency. Are they simple things, not just did something say, somebody say something, did they forget what potentially happened, you know, a big family moment, a wedding, um, somebody, you know, a, a birth, a big event. Socialization is another big one to kind of look for. Are they withdrawing from certain friendship circles where they were in previously? So these are the three big indicators that a lot of times people look at in terms of just any type of behavior, memory loss, appearance, and then socialization. So always want to be alert for that. Home safety is another big key. One of the things that we will see a fair amount is when an, an adult be you know gets over the age of 70 let's say they've got a bedroom upstairs or the stairs are fairly narrow moving the bedroom downstairs um, obviously looking for um, any potential hazard that could happen in, in the house appetite is another big one as well too loss of appetite just with anything is going to indicate some sort of potential illness so we're going to talk a little bit about what can make seniors top targets? Now, a lot of fraud started to pick up during COVID, during the pandemic. So 2020 and 2021, there was a big shift towards this. You can see $3 billion a year is lost in financial scams. And when you look out here on the right-hand side, so your typical scams that, you, that you'll see are somebody's calling to offer technical support, fraudulent business opportunities, sweepstakes, or they will pretend to be family and friends. 
when we, when we talk about specifically the three billion dollars a year that's lost in financial scams um, oftentimes the reason why seniors are top targets is they have a significant amount of savings in the bank and also investments and i'll actually touch on this point here later in the presentation we get asked a lot of times how do you prevent fraud in certain accounts or certain retirement accounts so i'll touch on that too the second reason is a lot oftentimes they spend time using medical and government services and these are two industries that are targeted by cyber criminals especially the past couple of years and the third reason that makes seniors top targets is they may have dementia or be emotionally vulnerable to a caller's pitch yeah um it is interesting we we had somebody from the fbi who spoke with us um, a couple of years ago about this topic and they would say that the the people that would call for scammers they would first try to initiate just conversation and, and then once they would have them in conversation for about four or five minutes then the scammer would have basically know that they're going to be able to provide to retrieve some sort of identification from the, the the person that's under their line so there's a lot of different tricks that that they will attempt to do but here's how we fight this so some some proactive ways that you can protect your parents identity is first of all be proactive Take away your, your parents' social security card and lock it in a safety deposit box or other secure location. So a lot of times what we recommend is the social security card, um, insurance policies, retirement policies. Try to keep all those in a fireproof location. That way it does number one, it will protect their identity. Number two, if something were to happen to them, it's in a central location. And again, communication is the key. So if the children know where those items are, then they have the ability to retrieve that. The second point here, you can work with your parents to get a free credit report from all three credit agencies every year at annualcreditreport.com. This used to be a fee that they would charge to get your credit report but you don't have to, it, it's, it's now free and there's no fee for it anymore. The, so here's one point that I wanna make sure that if there's something that, that if there's one thing you get out of the presentation, this is one of the points. You have the ability, even if, if for your parents or for yourself, you have the ability to freeze your credit. This is one of the items that when we had somebody from the FBI talk to us about it, they highly recommended. So what freezing your credit does, you can go to all three of the credit agencies. So Experian, um, Equifax, TransUnion. You can go out to their website and you can say, I wanna have a temporary freeze. So what that means is you are freezing your credit. Nobody can go out and get a credit card or a loan on your account. And if somebody does, then you get notified immediately. So the only way that you can open up an account is you have to go to one of those credit agencies online or call them up and say i want to temporarily unfreeze my credit and then you can do that for a day two days let them run their credit report and then it will freeze back again so me personally um, i actually have my credit frozen my wife's all five of our kids and my parents so if we are trying to get a loan for something at times yeah it can be a little bit of a of, as we have to go to those three websites and unfreeze it but then for one day of a potential inconvenience we have 360 plus days where nobody can open an account under ours because our credit's frozen so i highly 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 recommend and we can talk about that at the end as well is to look into temporarily freezing your credit especially for your parents too so that the third point, check financial records, credit cards, and banks accounts frequently. This is the big key. One of the things that we've seen is, especially with bank accounts, it may be a small transaction, maybe four or five dollars that you see as a withdrawal. So what a lot of fraudsters will do is that that they'll use that potentially for phishing. So they may try to, you know, hack your account and then they'll just take small amounts. And then if you're not noticing those, they can potentially take larger amounts. It's very infrequent that that happens, but that's just one of the tips that they will potentially use to try to get access to someone's account. 
Um, urge parents to let numbers they don't recognize go to voicemail. The nice thing now is I, I just got a call on my phone about 20 minutes ago and it said scam likely. So it's nice to have the ability that those are just automatically blocked. But adding your parents to the do not call list at do not call dot, uh, dot go will go a long way to protect against any type of fraud. And the last one, um, for a $2 fee, you can register your parents at dmachoice.org and that will block direct mail marketing to your parents for 10 years. So basically any type of, of scam marketing that especially you'll see a lot where they'll talk about your mortgage. It will say open immediately, call us up. This is about your, your interest rate loan. They look fairly legit too. It will block those types, the majority of those types of mailings. So I highly recommend going through all of these steps too. So when we talk about um, one of the things that we, we that can be a potential touchy topic is housing needs. Now, when you look at this, these are potential issues um, that need to be addressed. When we look at these, so moving in with a relative or having a relative move in with a parent, the cost can vary. If the parent decides to downsize into an apartment, again, the cost can vary. Here's where, the, here's where the items get fairly costly. When you're looking at assisted living, the average cost in 2019 was right a little bit over $48,000. Home care average cost was a little bit over $52,000. So nursing home facilities, right over $100,000. So I share these facts because having a realistic discussion with your parents about their wishes is best done before any needs arise because what happens is if, if a discussion does not come up prior and all immediately you also have to send someone to a nursing home you're acting on emotions which makes absolute sense but you're acting more on emotion and the chance of you um, being stressed out or making a poor decision is way higher than having already discussed the potential costs that could happen from a nursing home or a, a, an assisted living um, uh, location. So this is where we get a lot of questions typically is how might your parents respond? And every parent can respond differently. As I said, my parents respond differently to this discussion than my wife's parents and then also my wife's friends' parents too. So one of the things that's, that's a key is you think about, it, I mean, will your parents be thrilled that you're wanting to become more interested in their financial affairs? I mean, some parents will welcome the interest and intervention and some may even be relieved by it, but others may not be as receptive. So if it's a matter of safety, push your parents on it. If not, pull back. As I mentioned before, just bring up little points of conversation. Um, if your parent is not up for the topic at all, obviously find an outlet for venting, feelings of frustration. There are some groups you can talk to, talk to a friend, maybe a family member as well. Um, one of the things that, so we live about 14 hours away from, from my parents. And um, when, you know, when my parents get sick now and I talk to them, um, they might be a little bit hard headed about certain things, which is understandable hearing that from their son. But the nice thing from, from my standpoint is my sister lives five minutes away. So I have the ability to, to vent frustration to her and then she can go over and talk to them too. So that, I share that because it's very important so you don't feel like it's just you by yourself, whether it's a sibling or a friend to confide in too. So the other thing is, is respecting the parent's desire to be autonomous and accommodate <clears throat> when possible. And just with anything, try to understand the motivation behind the parent's behavior. If they don't, if, if they're not very receptive to it, think about why are they not very, very receptive to it. I mean, typically what we've seen is when parents are not very receptive, it's because this is their child that is is asking them these questions. And it's, it's, it's a difficult conversation. I mean, I think about that too. You know, from my parents' standpoint, my whole life, they guided me and told me what to do. And then all of a sudden, their kids potentially have to take care of them. So it's it's just a, a different mindset. And so try at least being able to understand the motivation behind their behavior can really help reduce the stress from your standpoint too. 
But one of the things you got to think about is what is it about the proposed solution that makes them upset? And then what are their concerns and fears? So if they're not open to talking, then maybe their fear is that they don't they don't have enough money and they're they're too too proud to ask for money. Or, you know, there there's some concern that they have that they just don't feel comfortable talking to you about. And if that's the case, it's okay to also bring in maybe a financial advisor or um, a medical professional, but just at least continue to facilitate the conversation. So now we're going to look at caregiving costs and how those costs might impact you. So there are many costs associated with caring for aging parents, including emotional and physical. So in this section, we're going to focus on the financial costs. So in some cases, adult children they'll reduce their hours or quit their jobs to care for elderly relatives. According to a 2017 study, adult child caregivers in the United States suffered a cumulative loss of nearly $3 trillion in earnings. So when you look at this, the impact on income is the average total of loss income for men is around 283,000. Average total of loss income for women is just north of 324,000. But the reality is, is that many people this age are helping aging parents meet their financial obligations, sometimes using their own retirement savings to compensate for the lost income as they pay a parent's cost. I'll revert back to the 40-70 the rule. This is one of the, the sections that impacts the 40-year-old more than it does the 70 year old because a lot of times the 40 year old will will get involved in the situation not having an idea of how much this potentially could cost so knowing these data points and having the conversation again communication is going to, to help quite a bit down the road when you look at it so yeah so the average age of an adult child caring as a caregiver is is right over 49 years old so again fits right into that 40 70 rule that we talked about before so a recent aarp survey found that 54 percent of caregivers were providing one thousand dollars or more in support in a 12 month period and 20 percent have provided five thousand dollars or more in support in a 12 month period as well. So let's look at, um, and right now with 10 million caregivers providing unpaid care to an adult with health or functional issues. So what are they spending it on? Uh, so when you look at the 54%, the 20%, the 10 million, a lot of the big topics are going to be food, housing, rent, uh, bills, credit card debt is one that can, can sneak up. We don't run into student loan debt all that often. Oh, something that would happen would be when a parent was providing the student loan debt, the student loan for their kids. But credit card debt and medical expenses are number number um, medical expenses number one. Credit card debt is number two. Those are the two most popular ones. And especially right now with where credit card rates are, I saw that uh, I think the average credit card interest rate right now is somewhere around 17 or 18 percent so when we talk about a couple slides before about being aware of, of watching bank statements watching financial statements, just keeping in the loop to make sure you know what is your rate and what is the activity on your card so we've already talked a little bit about the the cost and some of the things to look for so now we're going to look at how to prepare a plan that can ensure you're addressing key concerns. So big thing is checklists. I mean, you may already be assisting your parents with personal, financial, and other medical care matters, or you may have noticed behavioral or physical changes that cause concern. So the checklist is going to really help you organize your activities for overseeing their financial well-being and physical and uh, physiological health too. So a written record is going to be the key that includes notes and also observations and ensures the information is available to anyone who needs access. This can be very helpful taking notes, especially when you're going to a doctor, if something just seems off, 
you could say, you know, on Sunday, my dad was exhibiting this signs. Um, two weeks later, the same exact thing. And that way, that way you don't have to sit there and try to relive everything at the office. You can provide them with the notes. So gather details, keep records, track down documents because you will likely need them at some point. The household balance sheet, again, this can be from a financial standpoint or activities um, that you exhibit throughout a typical day for them. This is a big key is manage and reduce risk by anticipating issues that might arise. And that's going to be big, especially when we're talking about safety in the household. You definitely want to assess the financials and situation of the parent. One of the questions that I had asked um, my parents is they have an insurance policy. But as we're talking about this, um, because my mom's very communicative and um, very open with their finances, as we just talked about, you know, what do you need for funeral expenses? Um, what do you guys have for your pension? What, per what percent of your income is expendable in any given month. And so what I mean by that is, is let's say when you're doing your finances and your parents, you're talking to your parents every other year and they say, I have about 10 to 20% of my um, income, whether that be from a pension or retirement plan that I can do whatever with. That's very important because as they're going to get older, 10 to 20% at 65 or 70 may sound, may sound great, but the bills are going to go up higher if they are on an insurance plan. The costs are going to go up higher. So usually you want to be able to try to keep a consistent 10, 15, 20 percent of, of expendable income. And that way also they can, you know, spend time with grandkids, spend time with their kids, too. But assessing financials is going to and planning for that is going to drastically reduce the stress that would happen down the road. One of the other points I'll mention about assessing financials is if you're working with a financial advisor, you can have them do what's called a, a gap analysis. So, and what a gap analysis does is it will, it will basically look at all the money you have right now and how much you need to live off of. And then let's say you're, you're 65 years old. It will actually, the gap analysis will show, do you have a shortfall in income five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, et cetera. All the web's like, 100 years old, you can do if you want. And by doing the gap analysis, let's say I'm 65, and by 85, I show that I'm not going to have enough money based on inflation and based on my current living standards. That gives us plenty of time to plan and prepare. Maybe I need to start saving more retirement. Maybe I need to cut back on certain bills. But again, a gap analysis from a financial standpoint is another item that I highly recommend that's not on this presentation. So the final and the last one on this, finalize estate planning um, with your parent and make sure that they are able, they are obviously coherent and able to express his or her wishes um, upon, uh, upon passing away. So when we talk about some of the documents that you will want to have access to, bank account statements, a lot of these are very similar as we talked about before, but you know, bank accounts, credit cards, the bills. What, what, what you're looking for with these is just to, when you're looking at them, is to determine consistency. If, if they are on a fixed income, you can look at their income tax returns. Um, and you can basically you look at their monthly bills. If their monthly bills are fixed, you can kind of look through that. We track everything on an Excel spreadsheet. So if for whatever reason, we saw a mass amount that was withdrawn from a bank account, when we when print them off, then we would obviously know there's something that, that just seems odd right there. But um, bank account statements, what we typically see, and this is what the, the FBI has told us, is most people, when their accounts are hacked, the reason why they're hacked is because their password is password. And I, I'm not saying that as a joke, but um, most of the time their password is password. It's nothing that's too creative. Hackers know this. And the other thing that they're aware of too is when people um, are in an office setting or in a public setting, 
a lot of times people will have their passwords and their user IDs taped onto their computer or onto a desk. So if you are if you are in in a, in a work environment, that's a typically going to be an, an easy thing to for them to prey off of. So definitely want to make sure you're, you've kept track of these documents. Birth certificate is going to be another big one. Passport and also um, military records as well. So when we talk about creating a household balance sheet, so again, all sources of income, a full accounting of everything, debts and liabilities, this is going to be the big key, especially when you're trying to do analysis, how much is coming out versus, or how much is coming in versus how much you're sending out. Right here, the second from the bottom, the long-term care insurance, is there a policy, should there be one? I'm not going to get into this at this point right now, but this is one that we typically recommend at least sit down and talk to someone to see, am I eligible, first of all, and does it make sense, is it cost effective for me to look into a long-term care insurance policy? What a lot of times people will do is they'll have a, a term insurance policy, but sometimes those can expire when you're in your 60s and 70s, and it doesn't make sense to re-up. Me, for example, I've got a, I have a 30-year term insurance policy that I bought years ago, and it expires when I'm 65. My plan is not to re-up at that time because it will not be cost effective, but my plan will be depending on my health to look into some sort of long-term care insurance policy. So when we talk about assessing financials and finalizing estate planning. So the number, the, the top one here is a big one. Is the parent capable of making sound financial decisions? Um, this can be anything from, you know, you know, what do you want in your will? Where do you want, who do you want for, to be your beneficiaries? Um, who also do you want to, to donate money to upon passing? Who do you want, you know, certain jewelry to go to? You know, I will say having worked in this business for 17 years, the large majority of people do this extremely well. And, and, and it's just one of those things where they might have one or two of their kids that are handling the situation. A very, very small uh, minority, we've seen it where uh, a parent may decide to give one of their children, you know, let's say you've got two kids and the kids thought they were going to get 50% of each. Um, they decided to give one kid 99% and one kid 1%. Um, it, it's every family, every family is different, of course, but I will say that, that, that the, the pain that that causes because the parent is gone and if there were any issues, they cannot be addressed at that time um, is kind of sad. And so that's when we talk about if there, if there are issues and if they are uncomfortable, again, back to their slide, push on them. If you think there's something uncomfortable, try to push and have a conversation about it and just communicate about it. And not even from a financial standpoint. Um, and I, in that example I give, you know, the person that got 1%. You don't want to have a conversation just to get your other 49. You just want to have a conversation because it's your parents, you know. So is, is the parent's financial situation stable and secure enough to cover the expenses? You know, the, one of the big ones here is this second one from the bottom. Is there a need for assistance with Medicare? That's a big topic as well because medical expenses can be pretty expensive. And will the parent need financial assistance from family members? We talked a little bit about some of the costs. But that can be where, where maybe if there's two or three siblings, you can discuss, here's what we need to do. How are we going to plan for that? And maybe if one of the siblings is not able to help financially as much, maybe they can help more physically, you know, being there, checking in on a parent, um, being there from a mental support standpoint as well, too. So just a lot, of, a lot of different things that we see. But again, the key comes back to communication with it. So managing credit accounts and finances of a loved one. This goes back to, again, the different verification types. So you want to have a copy of a birth certificate, social security card, and a driver's license. To verify your ability to legally act on your parents' behalf, you absolutely need to provide a, a copy of a court order 
um, or typically what you'll see is a power of attorney. Now, for those that are on this call right now that are sitting there thinking, they heard the word power of attorney, they're like, okay, we're thinking about that. Make sure when you talk to someone about it, there are various types of power of attorneys. And whatever, whatever lawyer that you are, are working with to talk about the power of attorney, the key is you want to explain to them, here is what we want to have access to. Can you draw the power of attorney up to fit those needs? One issue that we see with power of attorneys is people will say, I have power of attorney, but the way that it was drawn up it is not a full power of attorney. So it might let them act, it might let you act on your parents' behalf in some situations, but not in others. So again, just clarity to make sure that you fully understand what is included in the power of attorney and also that your parents are fully cognizant of that as well. You know, here's some other things that we see. Professional money management services, that can be, a, another big one, a lot of times what some kids will, what some children will look at is they'll look at their parents' retirement plan and if they are not, um, if they're not well versed in investing, then a lot, so a lot of times what will happen is they will just ignore and just put on the back burner. What can potentially happen there is if, if a parent is invested too aggressively in the market and we have kind of what's happened in the market the past three, six months, you could potentially lose 15, 20%. So we highly recommend if they have a retirement account, first of all, they are working with a financial advisor and obviously you can shop for different financial advisors. Find one that, that you're comfortable with and that your parents are comfortable with as well. On that, when we go back to the power of attorney, if your parents have an account and you have power of attorney, you can be on that retirement account to try to help get access to that information as well. Bill payment services that you can do too, and then also um, professional fiduciary services, which is going to be like somebody who's doing your taxes, somebody who's drawing up trust, I'm, I'm sorry, estate documents and power attorney documents as well. This, these can be, these services can be very helpful if your parent uh, has a fair amount of assets or if they've got a complex portfolio and what I mean, I mean by that let's say they have retirement product programs they have real estate and other interest bearing uh, accounts as well the other thing why the professional money management can be helped is if they do not live near you too so that way you, you have somebody that's, that's actively trying to help with you too so when we talk about caring for your parents the, the big key is again easing the burden um, as they get older if you need to, you can obtain a handicap sticker from your parents' physician. One of the things you can do as well, we actually did this for my, my, my wife's grandpa uh, when he was 85. We bought an inexpensive wheelchair for him. And this was interesting because he was very reluctant to do that. He was a very active guy, and but he, he had very bad knees. And it was one of those things where he just didn't want to acknowledge it, which I fully understand that. Um, that's a difficult transition to make. And so what we said was we said, okay, grandpa, well, how about this? If you, if you just use it when we're walking for durations more than half a mile, and he's like, he, he would make a joke about people. He was like, okay, that's fine. I'll do that. So we didn't get him to use the wheelchair all the time, but at least we got to him to be able to use it a little bit. So again, going back to the communication, if, if, an, if, a, if an adult is not willing to do exactly what you're wanting them to do out of you caring for them. Just try to get them to come halfway. And a lot of times that can work pretty well. Uh, provide a cane uh, for a loved one can be another way to help ease the burden as well. This is a big one that has really picked up recently is consider grocery and meal delivery services. You can go to ones, um, I mean, DoorDash is a big one right now. If you live closer to most grocery stores, they will have this that you pay a monthly fee to. Um, I know that when my grandparents were alive, we used this with them for um, for a little bit just to deliver the meals if the if the weather was bad. And like I would always joke with my grandma, I'm, I'd be like, Grandma, I'd rather have somebody <laughs> with the, that that's 20 risking their life out there on the ice than you. And of course, she didn't agree with me, but 
but at least it, it, it kind of lightened the mood a little bit in terms of the service that we wanted to, to provide for them. I'm hiring a home health worker to identify potential hazards. This can be very helpful to bring a professional in. It, it might be a smaller fee. Um, you can find somebody that works in a nursing home and they can potentially just come in and just tell you certain things just to watch out for because that's what they deal with every single day. I think the big takeaway with this is when I talk about communication, again, is just remember that, that your parents have spent a lifetime in charge of every facet of their affairs. So creating a comprehensive plan and finding the courage to just have difficult conversations earlier in the process can result in better outcomes for everyone. Uh, I think we've all been there or we knew a friend who waited too long and the situation was very stressful and they just, they just kind of regret how they handled it. So um, the way I looked at it, when I started talking to my parents about it, it was, it was, we were just, just sitting around the house. And I think I brought something up as a joke, um, you know, to my dad one time. And then we, we kind of left it there, but then it made him and my mom think about it. And then they kind of revisited it every time I see them right now. So it's just, and it's not, it doesn't have to be an hour long conversation. Um, I think multiple conversations, five, 10 minutes here. And then when it gets to be more serious, then, then you can get down to longer conversations. But just keeping it very open and very candid is gonna be the big, the big key um, with that. But I, I think the, the one thing I did wanna point, and I know we're gonna, I'm gonna throw it back to Kelly and I think we're gonna open up for questions, but again, the big takeaway with this is communication, but also the ability that you have to, to freeze your credit and temporarily freeze that. Um, those are that's going to go a long way. The other thing that we get asked quite often is people when we talk about financial documents, somebody will say, um, "Well, I shred all my financial documents. Is that okay?" We have the FBI. The person that came to us from the FBI said, "The, the typical cross shredder that you buy at a Best Buy or you know at a, at a local store." Those, if it is a mid-level hacker, they can put those documents together two minutes. And he actually showed us how he does that. He said, do not buy, if you're, if you're shredding documents, do not buy your typical shredder. They will have one that you have to ask for that will have a code on it that will not just cross shred it, but it will shred it multiple directions. So what, what he said to recommend is when you go to the store, you say, and he said, just ask this simply, I want the shredder that will prevent people from putting it back together. He said, that's the easiest way to say it because you don't want to ask for a specific brand, but that's what you want to look for. And so, so we actually did that in our office too. And it, he, he's, he's correct because like I said, when they, they, this guy that we talked from the FBI, they deal with a lot of financial claim and he said that's one of the ways that people will try to steal your identity is dig through your trash and go through your shredded documents so make sure you're getting a proper shredder that will be the best to prevent against fraud so i'll pause right there um kelly and i'll throw it back to you to see if we have any questions Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, every, for everybody on tonight's webinar, we'll go ahead and open it up for the Q&A portion with the time we have remaining. If you have any questions that you thought of during today's presentation, you can go ahead and submit those using your question feature. Otherwise, we will go ahead and get started. I know we had one pop up um, earlier in the presentation, Matt, in regard to um, the numbers around housing costs were those costs per year or or an estimated total yes so those those are typically those are going to be typical costs per year yeah so when you're looking at, at those so hang on a second so i'm going to pull up so in yeah in 2019 for example when you look at at home care 52,000 that's going to be from an annual standpoint absolutely and now keep in mind, these are figures that were in 2019. So what I typically say is when you look at inflation, which is the price of the cost of goods year over year, right now we're around 8%. So 
the number right now is going to be a little bit higher. It's probably going to be for home care somewhere around the fifty-four dollars to $55,000 figure. But either way, the, the, the big takeaway with that is find two or three locations close by and just make a phone call and say, what would your annual cost be for, uh, for home care, um, for assisted living? And then that will kind of give you an idea because if you can take three different examples, some are going to be higher because they provide more services, but it will give you, you and, and your other family members a range of where you think you'll be targeting over the next couple of years. But I always recommend at least once every two years, call around for a quote. Great question. Our next question is asking, my parents live out of the state that I currently live in. What's the best way to ensure I have all of the necessary information? The, so I would, I would um, expect that the, the questions make the, the, the proper information in terms of financial documents. We'll talk about that one first. So the first thing is what I would ask is, are they working with a financial advisor? If they are, or if they are working with a tax professional, um, they can provide you with first. They should have, especially the financial advisor should have that information. Um, if the parent is okay with providing you with, with the, the information on their accounts, what you wanna find out is what account do you have and what is the financial institution? For example, um, I have, I, I have an, an IRA at General Electric Credit Union. Okay, how many accounts do you have? I have two accounts there. I have an IRA um, money market and I have an IRA CD. So having that information, especially if you are, are further away, is going to be very helpful. What I would recommend too, this is what I do with my dad, is any of his financial accounts. I said, dad, if you're comfortable with it and if you're not, that's fine. I said, just send me your most recent statements. And also, um, if you want to send me your login information, and that way I can have access to your account. Now, I don't have power of attorney for my parents because they're they're very healthy, but, but my parents, they don't want to log into their accounts. So if they have any questions on their account, they just call me. If I ever wanted to, if I went, you know, rogue and decided to withdraw money, I couldn't do that. So if they have, if you feel like your parents might have that concern, they just don't have you on the account. But getting the most recent quarterly statements and finding out which institution their funds are at is going to be a great start to determine uh, what assets they have and where you might be able to, to help them out with if there's a shortfall. Our next question is asking, do you have any suggestions for conversation starters? My father-in-law is resistant to talking about his finances and health, but we know there are conversations we need to have with him as his health has started to decline and he now lives alone. Okay. Great question. So th this, we get this one quite often because this, this is probably one of the most difficult conversations. So I'll take it from two different approaches. If if they are one that likes to joke a lot, um, as I said, you know, so we've got a family member who, who likes to joke a lot. Um, one of the things that we'll do is we'll bring it up like, you know, in, in passing, like a joke, like if I were to say to my, let's say to my dad, for, I could say something like, hey dad, you know, you know, you help me live this, you know, you, you help me do all this stuff. And you taught me all this stuff and I'm trying to help you out. And you won't even let me have, you only let me have access to anything like that. You know, something like that. I've seen people do that and it works pretty well. But the one thing I would say is let's say that the person is very standoffish um, about even just joking around or trying to get information. The best way to do that is to ask them for advice. So if they're resistant to it and we know it, then what I would say to them is I would say, if my dad was like, I'd say, hey dad, I have a friend, here's the situation they're in. Obviously, I'm not gonna make it exactly my, my, my dad's situation, but I would have it pretty close. I would say, what do you, what would you recommend me tell this person to do? Because what that appeals to is everybody wants to help somebody else. So whether somebody's in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever age, 
asking them to help you with something, you can usually pull out an answer or um, what they truly feel about it rather than, than make them answer directly about their own situation. So based on what I little I know about this circumstance, that's what I would do is lay the situation out and then ask them for what, what they would recommend advice to tell the person that you're talking about. But it, it can be, and it can be difficult. And I think I'll go one step further. But let's say they're not even receptive to that. Then I think a couple of things you could do is, is if you have information, whether it's on a pamphlet or something like that, leaving it around the house, you know, let's say the, the communication is very difficult with the parent um, and you don't feel comfortable enough talking to them directly about it, make a list, like we talked about, make a list of items you're concerned about for their well being. And then go up to them. I get those. That was my dad. I'd say, Dad, um, I'll be honest, I'm not comfortable talking about this with you right now, but I'm stressing out about this. And here are five or six items that I would love to talk to you about, whether we do it on the phone, and then give it to them that way. That way, you're not pressuring them. You're basically saying, We don't have to talk about it right now, but it means a lot to me. So that's another way to look at it. But I think the, the fact that you're asking the question, that's crucial right there because you want to communicate with them and you want to try to get them to open up. It's just, it just sometimes it can just take a matter of time. Looks like we have a couple more questions. Our next one is, where do I start if my parent has not yet thought about wills, savings, or living situations? Sure. So you can typically go to um, a, a, a the, there, any attorney in the area can do that. So one of the things that we will typically recommend is the, the best way is by referral. So if you know someone, let's say in your in your environment, let's say it's a, a work, at church, at a local organization that you're part of, a team, I would just ask them, does anybody have a, an attorney that they are working with? Um, and you don't, you don't even have to say it's will or trust specific because any attorney is going to be able to do that. The next thing I would do is I would go to a financial institution. And from that standpoint, I would say, who can you recommend that can help me out with a will? What I would, me personally, what I would try to avoid is what people do a lot of times is going out to Google and just typing something in. Because typically what you'll get is you will get someone who is paying an ad service to be at the top. And the way I look at it, when I went, when I when we put our will together, we wanted somebody that had been in the business for a while and knew what they were doing. That way, we could avoid a lot of the pitfalls. So go try to go referral first, and if not, go to your financial institution, a bank, credit union, and ask them. Our next question is in regards to parents who are living independently and handling their own affairs um, until a scenario happen and they're in a drastically different situation um how do adult children handle poor judgment and decisions made by adults so handling poor judgment by adults i think the the worst thing it's kind of like handling i guess even children i think the, the worst thing you can do is just you know blow up at them i mean especially since they're adults they probably know that they made the mistake and so I, I think, first of all, acknowledging like, like, let's say, let's say, for example, I'll, I'll just say, let's say my mom, you know, racked up a bunch of credit card debt. Let's say she racked up $50,000 in credit card debt, um, buying, you know, something that, that uh, a hobby of hers. Um, obviously, we acknowledge it. And then it's because you want to point out, but then immediately go to, here's a plan we have to, we have to do to get this thing taken care of. And then just leave it at that and fall back and with them on the plan. Uh, where we've seen this go south is again coming at them in a negative way, and then um, child basically, you know, saying, you know, I, I'm I'm going to follow up with you on this, you know, every every week, you know, if they're not doing anything with it, then that's where you would obviously get again go back to that. You keep pushing them on it, pushing them on it to get something done, but I think. Just being sensitive and having empathy for the decision, I think that is going to be the, the big key there. Now, if you see, again, if you see where it is, 
let's say it's just a one-off. If it's a one-off, then use what I mentioned before. But let's say it's you're seeing two or three or four or five times where it's happening. That right there is where um, it's one of those potential signs that something might be uh, might potentially be off. And a lot of times where we'll see that is either fin financially or socially is where we'll see the, the, the top two. Financially, I mean by that is their spending, their spending just kind of goes off the rails. And socially is where they, they withdraw more than anything. And it looks like this might be the last question. Um, it's asking any tips on how to help an 85 year old parent move out of a childhood tri-level house to a one floor condo for improved safety and reduced upkeep. I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? It was an 85 year old and they're moving to a, a condo and they're, they're downsizing? Yes, and they were asking for any tips on how to help an 85 year old parent move out of a childhood tri level house to a one floor condo. Gotcha. That's so we get this one quite often too. And the, the best answer that we have gotten and that has worked very well is you think what has wh why do they want to stay in the childhood place because it's comfortable to them it provides a lot of memories and the and place um, can often seem it can seem scary it can seem cold there's no relationship there from that standpoint the the the, the top feedback that we've been able to provide is create that condo tailor it as closely as you can to what their life is about. So, so for example, um, let's say you have somebody who, uh, I mean, obviously we don't live anywhere near, near the mountains, but let's say you have somebody that they had, they had a mountain house their whole entire life and they grew up in it as a child and you want them to go to a safer place. Well, you could even, you could even create a fun thing. Like say, you know, we created this new condo because this is your next step right now. And it's going to be, um, the step that we have created specifically for you, mom, or for you, dad, and then um, pictures, whatever you can to literally replicate as much of the memory they have right now to just a smaller version. And while it's not easy to do that, because again, it is, it is a big change, that's going to be way better than having them go somewhere and when it's quiet and they're looking around they're just like this is there's just nothing about this that is is where i grew up so again pictures items if you have grandkids if they have grandkids or even just kids having little notes it's the big thing that we that we've seen too is is when there's downtime what do they go to so were there board games that they played in their house were there pictures um, the notes can help a lot too. Like we would do a, a box of like, you know, 10 to 20 memories. Like here, I remember doing this in this house. I remember doing this in the room or this in the backyard. You know, I, I've thrown out a handful of things, but they're all kind of along the same lines of how do you, how do you keep that memory in a different location? But that I would say, outside of the parent that is resistant the most one of the most popular questions that we get is exactly this one is how do you transition them to a, a safer place and i think when the last point i'll say is even when you're talking about trying to create a memory in that environment having a well thought out reason to the parent of why you're moving them there um, is going to probably is going to be very helpful because um, I think a lot of times when someone's trying to be moved somewhere and they're not told, then sometimes they can kind of feel like, you know, why why am I being pushed here? You know, I'm not that old. And so I think that telling them that this is more of a plan. We're not saying necessarily, you know, we're we're making you do this, but we want to provide you with the best plan. That way, you know, five years from now, we can come see it, 10 years, 15 years, yeah, et cetera. So just creating the easiest transition and the most similar um, lifestyle or, or area that, that, they, that they grew up with is gonna be most advantageous. All right, and I know we are at our time tonight, so that's going to go ahead and conclude our Q&A session. 
Thank you, Matt, for taking us through today's content and presentation and answering all of our questions this evening. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.